Milserp Garage with the Luger P08. Had a terrible gun show weekend this weekend. <laughs> Only the Germans would invent something that cool. And uh, three gun shows over the course of Saturday and Sunday. And uh, check it out. In the holster here is a uh, magazine loading assist tool. We're going to take that out because is it is a pain in the ass to load these magazines. Got my 9mm snap caps. By the way, it's always nice to have your snap caps completely separated from any live ammo, number one, of course. And number two, try to, like, uh, get ones that are not plastic because those just start chipping and falling apart. You get pieces inside the gun, and that's never good. But, um... So try to get ones that are made out of the real materials. The, the um, projectile part of it, I think they try to make them not lead, but make them get them where they're painted so that the snap caps are easily identifiable. Just a little quick tip there. So, the Luger. What the hell? What a gun. So yeah, since I got nothing at this gun show, I figured I would bust out one that I've been holding on to like as a treat for this channel. And actually, it's not even just one. This is going to be like a like a one-two punch because it's unfair to do this without the P38. And the reason why is that this gun started the war for Germany. I don't mean started the war. I mean, it, it it's what they started with when World War II started. This is what they had. And then mid-war, they switched to the P38. And that's kind of like what they ended the war with, so... They kind of got to go together. So I guess I just, uh, that was a little bit of a spoiler there for what's coming up next or soon. But I kind of felt like they always had to go together. And uh, man, it's hard. It's hard to make a video on this gun because you don't, they, you could you could talk for hours just about the history. And I don't want to just regurgitate history. So I'll just give you a little bit. Um, they made these from 1898 to 1948. How's that? So you got commercial ones, then World War II ones, then commercial ones, then... I'm sorry. Commercial ones, World War I uh, guns, then commercial ones again, then World War II guns, then commercial ones again. Plus, there were some made by, like, the Swiss and stuff like that. So there's these other versions bouncing around. And what's cool is, you know, I showed you the last video where I bought these these catalogs of uh, Rock Island stuff. Man, are these things going to come handy even in, for this channel, I realized, because look how cool. It shows different ones here. You know, and if you poke around, there's like uh, artillery versions that have a really long barrel, naval versions that have a not quite an incredible long barrel like that, but sort of long. Look at these. These are American Eagle, which were built for export. And uh, so cool because this shows you the slides and it shows you the markings on them, the holsters. This is pretty cool. Look at them, it goes on and on. You could, uh, all these different models, Simpson and Company, Luger. These are uh, commercial versions of it, like just, you know, regular ones that sell to civilians. And I'll show you something interesting. Check this out. Tell me that uh, Japan, a couple of years after this thing came out, tell me that Japan wasn't completely copying this thing. I mean, look at that. There was nothing that had this this angle here like this and a, and a magazine that had these two fingers. Come on. Come on. Was it, that was an accident that four years after this thing was made, you started making these? Japan, please. Please. Look at them. I mean, ugh. let me get me started. There's so much borrowing with this gun thing because there was no, they didn't really care. It was like, it was, it was uh, life or death here. So they're like, listen, all due respect to the fact that you invented that. It's cool and we need to survive. So we're just going to use what you got because it's awesome. And that's basically uh, what a lot of countries did. All right, let's delve a little bit into the history of this thing. It's kind of weird. Oh, that water was good. Sorry, let me see if I could find, you know, 
Should have pulled this out beforehand, but there's this gun. I'm going to talk as I look. There's this gun called a Boar Shark. Okay, and this guy that worked for Winchester, an American, he invented this thing. And it was uh, the first semi-automatic pistol. It was around the beginnings of making semi-automatic pistols. Oh God, if I can't find this thing, it'd be crying because I know there's a really, there's a really cool picture of it in these books that I'm talking about here. I'll find it. Okay, thank God. Oof. So here's what it looked like. Right? It had this like oddly T shape here, which is weird because the the Luger eventually ended up with a radically angled uh, grip. So um, there's a huge departure there. It's almost like this was so odd and cumbersome and uncomfortable and awkward that they almost went overboard with the change. And I'm going to speak about this change in a minute. But this guy, Borchardt, he was. Uh, some dude from Connecticut, he worked for Winchester. Uh, he came up with the first semi-automatic gun. And, you know, back then, people were kind of, like, afraid of semi-automatic weapons, like the changeover. You'd think that they would be embracing that. But, you know, you can kind of imagine the attitudes of people that are like, I'll load my next round my damn self. You know, these people have, like, that kind of attitude sometimes about things, like they're afraid of change like that, even if it's something so radically, obviously moving in an improving direction. You know what I mean? Like, automatic transmissions didn't catch on. Like, you don't, you don't have to shift anymore, and it does it for you. But people were hesitant to even accept that. So this is what happens with those kinds of things. But in a case like this, um, this is a huge, uh, kind of like a radical thing that had to be on the back of this gun. It made this thing kind of kind of awkward. You know what I mean? Um, by the way, this one is expected was expected to sell for around ten grand. So you can imagine, it's not like you can go pick one of these things up at a gun show. They're they're very expensive. Um, but he brought this idea to to Germany to uh, to uh, Ludwig Lowe, who was making Mausers, and um, they started uh, producing these things. And then I think even uh, DWM. Is this a DWM? See, this is a DWM model here. So even even they started making it with that, that uh, you know, that merger, that uh, Waffenfabrik Low Berlin merger thing for DWM. The Dusche Metalle Patronfabrik or something, <laughs> whatever that was. That whole merger thing, this thing was kind of like in the midst of that and being produced by Germany. Now, what's interesting is that this is kind of like what held it back was this huge mechanism on the back that was like the spring, right? Well, some dude that worked at uh, the factory uh, with it was like his um, his assistant, but it, in some channels, if you read about it, he was more than just an assistant. He was like an integral part in designing this thing. So he was like his assistant, but he was an assistant that helped him actually design it so it wasn't like he just ran to get coffee this guy apparently was like half of the brains of putting this thing together so um when they tried to the manufacturers here tried to be like uh listen it's not doing too well it just was kind of like this this was an issue try to get rid of this thing this helper guy whose name happened to be uh luger he said uh hey how about we uh we could lop all this nonsense off back here and we can put a spring in here. We could figure out a way to incorporate it into the, into the, the hand, the uh, hand grip here. And um, so for supposedly this Borchardt guy didn't want to hear nothing about it. And he was just like, no, no, this is my pistol and this is the way it goes. Somehow it ended up, you know, he put his foot down and didn't want to make that change. So now, who really knows what the real history is? This is right around, you know, like the 1890s. It's not like uh, they were, anyone was doing any interviews with Oprah back then. Who the hell knows what happened? But when all the dust settled, the gun looked like this. And it was called a Luger. And uh, I don't know what Borchardt was doing. I think he worked at Dunkin' Donuts after that. I'm really not 100% sure. But nobody ever heard from that guy again. 
that was the end of boar short so apparently uh you know you don't want to come from america and start telling uh, germans what's what even if they're your uh, you know the helpers in your gun shop or whatever so so it's called a luger and then uh not only that but the round is called a luger the nine millimeter luger because that the borchardt was the one that invented that neck down 7.65 whatever 63 whatever it is that that luger that round that you know that neck down uh, round that was in these early uh lugers even and then uh then the nine millimeter came about and uh, even that was the end of even of that of that round even they even purged that round from history to 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 erase that guy so yeah he went back to connecticut i guess and probably sold used cars who the hell knows that was the end of him so that's kind of like a weird jack you know we talked so much about with john browning about how these patents how he protected everything even a bolt handle on a semi-automatic shotgun was patented and everybody else had to figure out how to do that with plungers and pushing the ground the, the grabbing the barrel and pulling the barrel back and using the ground to do that and blowing your head off that's that widowmaker shotgun there's all these crazy stories even about all that it was all just because of browning patented a patenting a bolt handle how this borchardt guy couldn't have patented this whole entire toggle lock system so this luger guy couldn't just come along and steal it i don't know but that's what happened that is what happened so let's uh Let's move out of the history now because that's as far as we're going to go. I think I gave you enough to go on Google and start getting silly. Let's see what actually happens. You know what? I'm not even going to use the dowel. I'm going to use the, our, our dowel to see what kind of action we got here. But it's really hard to manipulate this thing. I'll snap the dowel. I'm just going to use my hands. So let's look at what happens when uh, the round explodes in here. What, what actually happens here. And... Uh, Look at that. I'm pushing from the barrel, but it's really... If I could grab just the receiver part of it, it would do the same thing. It's just nothing really to grab, but so if I pushed from here, it's locked together as the, uh, as the face of the bolt is pushed backwards by the exploding round. It's pulling the barrel with it. Everything's going all together. And it reach, when it reaches that point, the barrel locks, and the bolt continues back on momentum and it's uh it's the bolt itself is this toggle where it's locked together kind of like a straight arm this is like a straight arm where if you push a guy's palm or fist with a straight arm his whole body would move right but if he bent his elbow so this is the bent elbow now the arm moves and the body stays in one spot it's really hard to manipulate this thing to show you because it's very very tight you know but basically, this toggle is broken by this ramp right here that's on either side. And these, this is more than just a gripping surface here. These two things are actually integral to its operation. It kind of looks like it's just something to grab, you know what I mean? But it's, it's not. It's not just something to grab. It's, it's something that these things hit back here when, when the, uh, when the uh, what do you call it, this whole assembly goes rearward this part with momentum continues back hits into this ramp and gets knocked up in the air to break that toggle and go all the way back eject the round and then come forward again this would be pushed all the way back chamber the round now watch as it chambers the round it comes back into battery again so this is the time right here that's taken up with the explosion to not open too early so it's like, bang, the bullet's traveling down here as this travels back. So this whole assembly is moving backwards as the bullet's moving forwards. When the bullet exits the barrel, perfect time for this to contact there, break this toggle, and then we start opening up the breech here. And uh, this toggle, let me put the magazine in. It has a uh, magazine hold open, so when it's, when it's open all the way, you can see that that elbow goes way up in the air like that. See, that's like, that kind of jumps up in your face every time. That is something to, when you first shoot this thing, it's a little bit of a, whoa, because that thing, you see it. It's the sights and everything. Look, the sight is on it. So talk about losing your sight picture. I mean, your whole sight platform jumps up in the air like that or whatever. I mean, it's quick and it's fast, but nonetheless, it, it, it happens. So it's something that you kind of have to be, 
used to, you know what I mean? It's a little different than what you might be using if you're just using, like, let's say, a Glock, where it's true that your rear sight is moving, but it's just moving front and back. You're not really losing your sight picture. With this thing, for a flash of a second, you're, you're faced with, like, you know, that, just right in your face, blah. So it is something to get used to. But it doesn't really affect you that much because it's happening so fast. It's just kind of like on the last shot, it stays there. So that's a little odd if you're, you know, if you're in war and that was that last shot and you're not really sure if you actually hit your target or not. You know, if you, you didn't really get to see anybody fall down because that was right in your face. Ah, okay, well, I think there's nothing left to do except... Uh, Say goodbye to your Nazi balls. Now, to actually take this thing apart. So let's um, let's see what's going on here. Let's check it out. Let's see what's locking. Uh, let's see what's locking up this uh, this mechanism here and stuff. If we can, let's at least take this toggle apart. Okay, just want to make sure I'm in view. So takedown. What do we do here for takedown? So the mag is out. Um. Pull the trigger and then this right here is the uh is the takedown this here is the safety it's funny it's interesting i could show you now with the safety on it says gear shirt guess shirt which must mean safety or safe um or maybe that means yeah that's when the safe is on it says safe and um, oh, and one other interesting. I know I'm gonna forget, so I want to show you now. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna chamber one of these snap caps. I want to show you something really interesting. See, on the top along here, this is the uh, extractor here, right along the top, and you can see how it's flush with the toggle. But if we cycle around into the chamber, see how it stands proud, and it says something on there. Can we read what that says? Geladen, which means loaded. In German so that's pretty cool we have a loaded chamber indicator Germany wanted that so again let me make sure I'm centered all right let's see with the with the taking apart we have no magazine safety it will fire with the magazine out um, we take up the slack here a little bit with this uh, retracting and we pull down the takedown lever boom all right now this side plate right here is part of the trigger mechanism. The trigger mechanism is weird. So we pull the trigger, this comes off. The trigger mechanism actually actuates this, right? Odd, right? And then, and then which in turn actuates this, which, which pushes this up. You see that? And then inside it, it it's releasing the. Uh, the sear, the sear is like kind of like sideways, but we'll get to that, remind me. But for now, once you disconnect that, this trigger bar kind of thing on the side plate, uh, they have separate. And you have nothing here but, uh, you know, mag well and uh, trigger. The trigger just on a hinge, that's it. There really isn't any trigger mechanism uh, in here and this uh, locking. Um, the locking tab there so then left with this this was the problem with this gun this is why uh germany had to get the p38 going is because this thing was way too expensive to make because this is such a precision part right here this was made really nice so yeah it is kind of precision you know what i mean and and the wood is all pretty and everything, but just a regular kind of receiver, handguard, trigger kind of thing. It was this part. It was this toggle part right here. And once you take this pin out here, this just slides out of here. And you could feel like the there is no gap here. This is like finely machined stuff, you know. And you could see here again how that... This is where the sear um, comes, drops off of. So you see the sear is like on the side. Because we're going to go inside here. This is where the striker is, right? So when the striker is charged, it's, it's this piece right here. And this is what's snapping off 
the side of, of this in here, which is connected to this, which is actuated by this in the side cover when you pull the trigger, right? So you see, you see how that's how that's all moving along, and it and it moves along to in, in the inside the toggle right here. When you open it up here, you have now this is one of those things you can send across the shop. You got to be careful here. We'll turn this way and be very gentle. You have a plunger here and uh, spring and the firing pin. And you can see the firing pin. You see this. This is on the side, so this is the this is the top. This is how it sits like this in the gun. You can see that that that's on the side, right? So that's where the sear. See it? That's where that slips, and that's the that's the striker. The striker is charged here and released. The sear is on the side. That's why when you pull the trigger, you see this bulging out over here, and that's what releases it to come forward. So uh, kind of weird that that's like sideways, you know, but it's this, it's this toggle here that really boggles the mind. It's boggling toggling. It's so perfect that you don't feel any gaps here. You don't feel any looseness. This, this, this takes a long time to, to build and to make perfect like this. And, uh. Love to see things like that. It's nice that things like that are made, but for wartime, it's not uh, it's not optimal. That's what did it in. That's why Germany was like nice, but we got to build a war machine here, and uh, we cannot make enough of those. Sorry, we have to come up with something else. And uh, again, you have to be. I love to do this with a small screwdriver, but I pride myself in being able to do this without tools, but you have to be really careful of the launching, the launching of this, but I'm gonna grab a screwdriver in a second if I can't do it. Oh, whoa, that was close. That was a close one. It has to, it kinda has these fingers on it that you could use your thumb, but why does it seem tighter than usual? Maybe I'm just, it's Sunday in a week. There we go, come on, come on. I almost had it. This is embarrassing now. All right, getting the screwdriver. Sorry. It's not really that big of a deal to use the screwdriver, but it's so it's so possible to do without it that it's troubling. And there we go. In and turn. It's that easy. So that's the uh, that's the striker right there. That's the sear. It's the edge of the sear. And uh, this goes back in here. Uh, the pin goes in this way. And the pin goes here. There's the pin. That goes down. Trust me, when you're reassembling right do this upside down so what you want to do is let's get the take down knob back in there why is the take down knob giving me a problem there we go and you put you slide this upside down and i'll show you why because you slide it upside down and then when you bring it around it's real important where that goes that that hanging thing right there has to drop. Whoop! Did I lose it? No, it goes right there. And then you should feel the springing action right here. Then you know you got it right. So then what you do is you take this side cover, put it in place, push back, and turn the takedown lever up at the same time. There we go. Boom. So, let's, uh, let's show you how this works. This is the magazine loading tool, and this would go on here, because there's a button here 
that as you pull, you know, remember a couple, some magazines have this. Don't, don't some Rugers have this or something for the 22s? But, but man, that thing would tear up your finger. And what this does is just kind of relieve the pressure every time you want to go put a round in. So it just falls right in without uh, you having to go against that tension with your thumb. It is rough. I mean, you, you, you spend like some time on the range of going through, loading a few magazines and you, your thumb really starts getting raw. So that helps. I'm not going to fully load it. What does it take? Eight? It takes eight. Eight rounds. Um, but I just want to show you, it's, it's, um, you can't fool around with this thing. You got to really mean it when you, when you go to eject rounds and everything too. You got to really, you got to really yank on this thing. You will get them to come out, but you can't gingerly do it. And, uh, Geladen, you have a loaded chamber indicator there. And that's it. It's, uh, very, very reliable uh, system, this Tagalog system. And uh, what's interesting is like when you, the magazines there, they, they drop, you got a magazine release button here, so you could drop the mags, you know what I mean? So you could like combat reload this thing, you know, because the magazines, my hand got in the way there, but you can just drop them, right? And then when you come in with a full, it stays open on the last shot, right? A la 45. It's like very similar to the 45 as a combat handgun because you have a mag release button. So when you fire the last round, you know, like you drop your mag with a button and then you're, you're, you're got another magazine right in your hand and you're going right in. And uh, when you go right in, you, just, you swipe your hand across the top and that's what closes it. So it's a little different. You normally would be, uh, let's lock it open again. You normally would be used to, you know, having to grab a slide and pull or there being a slide release button. There isn't. It's kind of like an over the top kind of thing that you wouldn't be used to. So it's kind of like a Fonzie, like a Fonzie hair sweep to uh, close the action. So getting used to a couple of different motions to combat uh, reload, but you can't do it. You know what I mean? And it, and it fires fast like that and everything. It's very... It's very uh, snappy. You know, it really is. You can put a lot of rounds down range real fast with this thing. Um, it's just who the hell's going to load all those magazines for you? God damn, this thing is like, like when you're, when you're down near the bottom, you're just like, look at how tight it is. Look, even just pulling it here, just halfway, I'm pulling it. It's, oh, jeez. It's really a, really a thumb killer, but uh, for a single stack mag, you know, but I guess just, Part of how it how this toggle system worked, evidently, it needed a follower that was really pushing rounds up very hard because every magazine I've ever seen, they're all the same. The spring is very stiff, and, and by halfway, you're like, ah, ah, to get those rounds in, you're really tugging on this thing, you know what I mean? They're very, uh, very tight. So, uh, hmm. I know I'm forgetting a million things that I'm going to want to, I'm going to watch this video and this is a really hard video to make. What can you say about this thing? I can tell you this, that the stories that you hear where they go, well, the Germans, they um, they put a serial number on every little part. You know, for the most part, that's really not true. I have a lot of German firearms. They do have serial numbers thrown around, but not any more than Winchester or Remington had. You know what I mean? They all had their own little thing with uh, build numbers or... Um, proof marks, inspection marks, serial numbers. Um, the Germans, yeah, they put some serial numbers on stuff. Mausers have a few extra that other right than other you know countries put on their stuff, or whatever. They just did seem like they were they were a little bit into that, but it wasn't like it was some crazy. What got really crazy was this gun. This gun has a serial number on friggin' everything. As a matter of fact, just looking on the side right here, I can see. One, two, three, four, five, wait, six. That's just facing this one side. That's insanity. And uh, find a matching mag on one of these and uh, buy it no matter what condition it's in because the mags are very hard to find matching. 
um, there should be a database where people that have like with their serial numbers are looking for it. Like if anybody has 961W um, on their magazine, uh, please contact me immediately. And I have 5314K. <laughs> and uh 3902 charlie 3902 c i have so if you have one of those guns get out your checkbook no i'm just kidding i'm just kidding there should be a database where like unite unite gun owners with their magazines because there's several guns that are like that where the magazine has a serial number but they very rarely match it's like sure it's i'm sure somewhere out there is um the magazine with 961w on it i'm I'm pretty sure how could the gun survive but not its magazines you know what i'm saying it was probably in an area where for some reason it survived so that is the basically called the pistole parab i don't mean basically this is legitimately its name is the pistole parabellum luger po8 Parabellum meaning for war. Nine millimeter toggle lock short recoil operated. Single action designed by George Luger. Yep. So that's the story. I'm going to come up, follow up with the um, P38. That's definite. You're getting it. Let me see. Let me look at the schedule. The Walther P38. I'm going to pencil that in right now. Up next. Because, um, yeah, Germany didn't change the caliber. They stuck with the 9mm. Um, they just needed something that, in 1939, they had a lot of these around, and this was their pistol, but when they needed to start cranking things up, and that, tr that Treaty of Versailles was crumpled up and thrown in the garbage, and they were amassing their war machine... They could not make these things fast enough and cheap enough. They was just too... They were like, this is not a pistol for us right now. We need something. And man, did Walther come to the table with something amazing. And we're going to take a look at that next. So you all stay tuned. Thanks for the patronage. And uh, see you later.